So yesterday, guys, we started talking about, on well, the day before that, we talked about the forms of energy. Okay, so we talked about nuclear energy, chemical energy, uh, you know, um, we talked about um, electrical energy, magnetism, all of that kind of stuff. And we talked about how they were forms of two major types of energy, that is kinetic and potential. And when those go together, we have mechanical energy, right? What we want to look at now has to do more with thermal energy, okay? That is the flow of what we would otherwise call heat, but heat isn't really a form of energy. It's a transfer of energy. What we're going to look at today is thermodynamics, that is the changing of, of energy, the movement of thermal energy from one place to another, how that can do useful work, okay, and things like that. So um, there'll probably be a few things you'll want to highlight or little jot notes you're going to want to make in the margins here as we go along, right? This is stuff that's kind of the basis for our understanding of how energy gets transferred and converted, all right? Uh, so when we use machines, okay, all machines still have to obey the laws of physics, all right. I mean, if you ever watched like any of the old classic Star Trek, I mean, that was Scotty's big thing. He would always tell Captain Kirk that he cannot break he cannot break the laws of physics. Okay, you can't. You cannot break the laws of physics. Sometimes you might be able to find a way around them, but you can't break them. All right. And so, whenever a machine is running, it's obeying certain rules. All right. One of those rules is that it can't be a hundred percent efficient. Right? If I put, you know, a hundred dollars worth of gas in my truck, okay, I know that realistically only about eighteen dollars of that fuel is actually driving my car forward. The rest of it is wasted because an internal combustion engine is incredibly inefficient. All right. And we can we can kid ourselves and say we've designed them and made them better, and we have, all right, but realistically most of the energy from the fuel that's burned by the engine in your car is lost as heat. Okay, Realistically, when you burn fuel, it turns into heat, and we're using that heat to turn into mechanical energy. That's a really inefficient process. Most of the energy in your fuel is simply wasted. All right? There's resistance within all the moving parts, Okay, things like that, and really, Half, well not half, but about a third of the energy you're in your fuel is actually used to drive the cooling system of your vehicle that keeps your engine from melting down. All right, That's how inefficient it is. It actually has to use one third, so $30 of the $100 worth of gas is used to keep the car from self-destructing. Okay, That's just how inefficient things are. All right? There's certain laws of physics that you can't get around. All right? You can make things as efficient as possible, you can make the conversions as efficient as possible, but nothing's ever going to be 100%. Right. Now, we're going to focus on uh, one type of energy transfer, not one type of energy, one type of energy transfer, okay? and that is heat. And we said yesterday that heat is a transfer of thermal energy. Okay, now, you're probably looking at that and go, why did Kutter draw a triangle? Is he losing his mind? No, I'm not. In physics, a triangle means change. All right? The triangle is the Greek letter D, delta. Okay? Delta means change in science. All right? So, heat is a change in thermal energy. All right? So, anytime you see delta, and you're going to see delta a lot, okay? Delta means there's a change in the energy. Now, anytime you have a machine or you have two separate objects that are interacting with each other, we call that a system. Right? And usually when we're focused on energy transfers and energy conversions, those conversions are going on in a system. Everything outside the system we call the surroundings. And the surroundings interact with the system depending on the type of system it is. All right? So there's a few types of systems that we're going to go over. All right? um, so, a system is a series or a set of interconnected parts. Okay, and in the system, we have objects involved in energy transfers. Okay, everything else is considered the surroundings.
Okay, so the example they have here with the gasoline lawnmower, the system could be the engine. And the surroundings could be the other parts of the mower, the grass, the, you know, the, the air, whatever else. Okay, you have to set boundaries, but the boundaries you kind of pick. All right? If it was me and I was talking about a lawnmower, I would include in that system the grass because the blade of the mower is interacting with the grass and the blade of the mower is connected to the engine. So I would consider, I would have set the boundaries different than this example did. All right? I would consider the air, the surroundings. Right? But because the, um, the mower is actually interacting with the grass and cutting it down, it is transferring some of its energy to the grass. The grass is interacting with the engine. But again, it depends on your point of view where you set the boundaries. Okay? Now, when you define a system and its surroundings, there are different kinds of systems, three different kinds. Right? The most common system is an open system. Okay? And an open system exchanges matter and energy with its surroundings. Okay. Now, a lawnmower is a perfect example of an open system. Because when you run a lawnmower, it gets hot. Okay? And that heat naturally flows, as we learned yesterday, from a hot object to a cold object. Right? So it is exchanging energy with the surroundings. The heat from the motor, sorry, the thermal energy from the motor is going to be transferred to the surrounding air. So it's, it's definitely exchanging energy. It's also exchanging matter because it's taking oxygen from the air, using it to burn fuel, and returning carbon dioxide and water vapor. All right, so it is taking material, matter, from its surroundings as well. So, all right, so our, our body would also be an open system. All right, if we go outside in the wintertime, okay, we're going to lose energy to the surroundings because our bodies are hotter than the surroundings are, and energy is naturally going to go from us to the air. All right? In the same way, we're also inhaling and exhaling. We're exchanging matter with our surroundings. We're eating food. That's taking matter from our surroundings. Okay? Things like that. Does everyone follow me there? Okay, so an open system exchanges both. All right? A closed system okay, is one that cannot exchange matter but can exchange energy with its surroundings. So let's say I'm getting ready to make dinner and I take a Ziploc bag out of the freezer that's got a steak in it. By the way, I'm not a vegetarian. Okay? If you don't like your food to have a face, I'm sorry. Okay? I'll eat. I'll eat the cow. Walk it through a warm room and shave it. I'm ready. Okay? Anyway, okay, so I take that thing out of the freezer. Now, if I put it on the counter to defrost, is it exchanging energy with its surroundings? It is. It's going to absorb energy from its surroundings because it's going to thaw sitting on the counter. Right? If it's in a Ziploc bag, is it exchanging any matter with its surroundings? It is not. Okay? It is sealed off airtight in that Ziploc bag. Right? So no air is getting in, no air is getting out, no other material is being exchanged until I open the bag and barbecue it. Okay? Till then, it is a closed system. So anything that is sealed off but not insulated is essentially a closed system. Right? Now, even if you had something that was insulated, so if you had a thermos, okay? so insulated coffee mug or big thermos or whatever, right? that's still a closed system. Yes, it'll keep energy in and not exchange as much energy with its surroundings, but eventually the stuff that's in the insulated mug gets cold. Agreed? Okay. So it's still it's it's not a, you know a perfectly insulated or isolated system. It's still just closed because it does exchange ma uh, energy um, with its surroundings. Okay. It is sealed off. Okay. Like if I close the lid, you know, and shake it, nothing goes in or out. It's not exchanging any matter. Right? But it is exchanging energy. All right. The last type of system really is just theoretical. You, you can't really build a perfectly isolated system. Because to build a perfectly isolated system, it can't exchange matter or energy with its surroundings. And we really, realistically, have yet to build something that's perfectly insulated and with, with, withholds or keeps all of its energy. 
right? We, we really can't do that. There's no way to do that. Okay? The closest thing that humankind has ever really built right, to, a, to, be, to represent a perfectly isolated system would be the International Space Station. All right? It is, I mean, essentially isolated, but it still gains and loses energy from, its, from the sun to its surroundings, which is empty space. It's, in, it's insulated pretty well, okay, but it's still not perfect. Everyone follow? The, the sealing off matter, making a closed system is easy. All you have to do is make an airtight seal and you have a closed system. But to make a perfectly isolated system is really nearly impossible. It's impossible to perfectly insulate against the loss or gain of energy. You can do a pretty good job, but you can't make it perfect. All right, everyone with me there? Okay. The, really, the laws of physics essentially prevent you from building a perfectly isolated system because energy always has to flow from high energy to low energy, and there's always going to be some exchange of energy. Right? Remember, energy is not matter. It's harder to stop. Okay? It can flow through matter. It can move that way. Right? So it's not as easy to stop. Okay, yeah. there's a few laws of Thermodynamics, okay? So these are kind of the first laws of physics that you're going to learn, okay, in Science 10 here. Um, the laws of thermodynamics govern how energy moves, okay? Um, so the first law of thermodynamics tells us something really important. It's very much like the law of conservation of matter that we learned back in chemistry, okay? We said that matter can't be created and it can't be destroyed. Well, it's the same for energy. Energy can't be created and it can't be destroyed. Right? You can convert different types of energy, but you can't just magically make it. It'd be great if we could, but we can't. Okay? Nor can you ever completely destroy it. You can turn it into lower forms, but it's always going to still be there. All right? It just may not be doing anything useful anymore. All right? So the first law of thermodynamics okay, tells us how we can change the energy of a system. Okay? The energy of a system can be increased in two ways. Either heat can be added to the system, okay, or work can be done on the system by its surroundings. Okay? Those are the two ways that you can add energy. If you are adding heat, you're adding thermal energy. If you're doing work, you're adding mechanical energy. Right? So if the surroundings do that to the system, the system gains energy and the surroundings lose it. Right. Which means we're not creating energy, we're not destroying it, we're just changing where it is. Okay? From the surroundings point of view, it's lost it. From the system's point of view, it's gained it. All right? Now, the reverse is also true. A system can gain energy in these two ways. It can lose energy in these two ways. All right? It can add heat to something else, right? If the system is hotter than something else, it will transfer thermal energy, heat, okay, to the other object or the other system. If the system we have is moving very fast and has lots of mechanical energy, it can do work on something else. And then from its point of view, it will have lost mechanical energy because it transferred it to another thing. All right, is everyone with me there? Okay, but in both cases, the total energy is still the same. All we've done is change where the energy is and probably what kind of energy it is. Okay. All right. Um, so, and then down here is kind of the the opposite of that. Okay. Similarly, it could be decreased in two ways. Okay. Either okay, uh, heat can flow out of the system to its surroundings, or work can be done by a system on its surroundings, which is what we just said. Okay. Work done by a system on its surroundings is considered negative. Okay, because from our point of view, then we've lost the energy. From the surroundings point of view, that work is positive because it's gained the energy. All right. So the big thing here is this. This part that's highlighted, and I think it's highlighted in yours too, right? Okay. So just put a star around that. Okay. The first law of thermodynamics really just says that energy can't be created, it can't be destroyed. Okay. It says here that the total energy, including heat, okay, in a system and its surroundings, remains constant. Right? Whenever heat is added to a system, it transforms into an equal amount of some other form of energy. All right? So the amount of energy in the entire universe is fixed. All right? There isn't any place that's making energy. All right? Now, usually at this point, someone goes, but Mr. Coderre, the sun's making energy all the time. Okay? 
the sun is converting energy all the time. Remember that nuclear fusion, okay, harnesses the potential energy that's stored in atoms. The sun is simply releasing that potential energy as radiation, heat, okay, things like that. Everyone follow there? So that energy was there to begin with. The sun is converting it from the potential nuclear energy into the forms of energy we need. All right? So it's always, the amount of energy is always fixed. Okay? Now, does that mean that it's always in the same place? No. Energy is always moving. Right? It's always following the laws of thermodynamics and going from hot to cold. That's why energy never flows to the sun. Okay? It's the hottest thing anywhere near here. Right? So energy is always flowing away from it. All right. Um, okay, so this little equation here is kind of what we're talking about. If I add heat to a system, okay, that means that it's got to be turned into okay, some other form of energy, right? Because the, the total energy involved has to remain the same. Okay, so if I add energy to a system, the system's probably going to do some work, but in the process of doing work, it's going to have inefficiencies. Okay, those inefficiencies are usually friction. Okay, parts that are in contact with each other or have to move past each other have friction. Right, and that friction makes thermal energy, and that heat is transferred away from the system. Right, so what I put in has to come out. But it doesn't mean that it's all going to do something useful. This would be the useful work okay, that my machine does or my system does. This would be the energy that's wasted. All right. So this goes back to that example I used at the beginning of class. Here's the $100 worth of gas that I put in my truck. Okay. Here is the useful energy that drives my truck forwards. And the rest of that is lost. Okay. It goes to the surroundings. It doesn't drive my truck forward. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I haven't destroyed it. It just didn't do anything good. Okay, everyone follow there? All right. So, um, yeah. So we won't bother. We'll just that's kind of what this paragraph here explains here at the bottom. All right. How many people have heard of a perpetual motion machine? You ever heard that term before? Okay, a perpetual motion machine is a machine that supposedly can run forever without any input of energy. Okay. Do machines have moving parts? Okay. If machines have moving parts, whenever those parts move, what is going to be produced? Okay. What form? Okay. Some mechanical and some thermal. All right. Nothing can be 100% efficient, which means if I never put any energy into that perpetual motion machine, the perpetual motion machine eventually has to stop. Okay? No machine is 100% efficient. Therefore, a perpetual motion machine can't exist because if I get that thing going and there's, it's doing anything, it's going to be losing some energy. All right. There's always going to be some inefficiency, some friction somewhere, okay, or some conversion of energy from one form to another that's going to result in some energy being lost, and that's going to mean that the thing is going to stop. All right. Now, people have come up with all kinds of ideas on how they could make a machine that, once put into motion, would never stop. Okay. But the reality of it is, is that it's always going to stop. It might run for a really, really long time if it was really efficient, but it's always eventually going to stop. Okay, nothing goes on forever. All right, so um, people thought that they'd be able to uh, put this energy in and have it completely converted into mechanical energy, okay, and no energy would be lost. So if no energy was converted into other forms of energy, the machine should continue to operate. We would call that a perfect machine or a perpetual motion machine. Okay, in order to do that, the machine has to convert all the mechanical energy completely. Okay? All the mechanical energy conversions have to be perfect. Okay? And we just know that that's not possible. When a machine is running, how can you tell? How can you tell a machine is running? What are some signs? It makes sounds. 
Okay, if it makes sound, is sound a form of energy? Where is that energy going? Is it staying in the machine, or is it going to the surroundings? It's going to the surroundings. Sound represents an inefficiency and a loss of mechanical energy from the system. Okay, so sound tells us this machine's not going to run forever. It's going to stop. All right. Um, sometimes do you see, like in an electric motor, if you can actually see the electric motor, can you see sparks? Sometimes you see little blue electrical arcs. Okay, if you can see them, what form of energy is that? Light. Okay, and that light is traveling out of the system, meaning it's not staying there. So that's not 100% efficient either. Right? Uh, heat is, again, always produced. Machines, when they run, warm up okay? because of internal friction. So energy is always being lost. We can't make something perfect. A bouncing ball. I mean, if you just drop a ball on the ground, it never comes back up to the same height. Okay, Because when it hits the ground, it makes... What's that? Uh, well, no, if I'm holding it here, it has potential energy. But when it strikes the floor, can I hear it? Okay, this, then there was some energy that was lost. The shape of the ball changes, right? When you deform the ball, some of the energy is going into deformation, okay? Sometimes you can even feel it, right? If I'm standing right next to where the ball hits the ground, I can feel the vibration in the floor. That means energy was transferred to the floor, right? And that means that the ball has lost some of it. And that's why a ball never comes back up to the same height. Even those little, you know, those little tiny, like, super balls that you used to have when you were a kid, Right? I mean, they are pretty efficient. Right? When you when you drop one of those, they bounce pretty well. But do they ever bounce? Like, if I drop it, does it bounce higher than where I dropped it from? No, that's impossible. Okay? It would be impossible for a ball that I drop to bounce higher than the point I released it from. Because if it does, that means that it would have more energy than when I released it from here. That means I created energy. That's breaking the laws of physics. Right? Now, some of you are going, I'm pretty sure the ball would bounce higher. I remember those Super Balls. They were crazy. Okay? But you probably never actually just dropped it. You usually gave it a little bit of kinetic energy okay, on the way down. Gave it a little boost. Okay? All right. So that's the example here. They've got the bouncing ball. And that's converting gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy back into gravitational potential energy. But we're losing energy in the form of sound and things like that Okay, as we go along. All right. Second law of thermodynamics. Okay, The second law of thermodynamics is the one that prevents perpetual motion machines from existing. Okay, And that is it describes the flow of energy. Okay, what we learned yesterday, energy always goes from high energy to low energy, from hot to cold. Okay, that's the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, the second law states that heat always flows naturally from hot to cold, but never naturally from cold to hot. Okay, so these pictures here are showing you some people's ideas for perpetual motion machines. Okay, a machine that once running would run forever. So this circular one here, okay? So the idea is that um, as the wheel spins, because these things are curved, the ball would roll and then kind of get over this, uh, kind of get over the hump here, okay? And when it got over the hump, it would roll down and push downwards on the wheel, okay? Creating a force that's, this force here represented by the arrow that's driving this thing around, right? And then when it gets to this side and it's on at this point here, it's rolling downhill back to the middle, right? And then because it's in the middle, it rotates a little easier at the top than it does at the bottom when the balls are at the edge, okay? The idea here is that this would allow it to continue to move. Where are the places where that machine loses energy? Okay, so some energy is going to be lost as it rolls. Yep, for sure, because there's friction there. Okay, when a ball rolls on the surface, can you hear it? Okay, that's a loss of energy then, right? Okay, what about here? This is where the this is where the the wheel pivots. Are there surfaces in contact with each other, trying to slide past each other there? That's friction, right? Okay, even if I you know uh, oil that up really good and and make it really slippery and and whatever, it's still 
got two surfaces in contact with each other. There's still going to be energy lost here at this point where the two surfaces contact each other. So there's still energy lost in this machine. It is eventually going to stop. All right? This one here, I think, has the most potential to work because it uses a magnet. All right? Now, the problem with this is it's not going to run forever. Okay? Magnets don't last forever. Okay? They eventually begin to lose okay, their magnetic properties. So over the course of time, this would eventually stop. But the idea here is that these, these uh, balls would be made of like, steel or something that would be attracted to the magnet. Okay? So the magnet would draw them up the hill, and then they would fall through the hole and go back down this smaller ramp. But here's where the machine breaks down. In order to get back to here where the magnet can attract them, they have to open a door. And that's work. Okay? It takes energy to open that door. So that's going to slow that ball down. Okay? And it's going to lose some energy right there each and every time. All right? Everyone follow me on that? Okay? Plus, there's, there's friction. right? Every time there's two surfaces in contact with each other, there's going to be some friction. Right? Now, even if you could make one of these and make it continue to go and go and go and go and go, would it ever do anything else? No. Okay? A perpetual motion machine, even if you could make one, would never do anything useful. It can't. Because work is a transfer of energy. And if it ever did any work, it would lose energy and stop. Because you're not putting any energy into it. Okay? If it transfers energy out, it has to stop. All right? So a perpetual motion machine is trying to get something for nothing. Okay? But it can't ever do any useful work because if it does, it's transferring energy away and it'll have to stop because it doesn't have any energy input. All right? Everyone okay with that? Yeah? All right. Yesterday we talked about um, uh, Sadi Carnot, okay? the French guy that uh, was studying how you could convert heat into mechanical energy. Right? This is kind of the design for what he was trying to do. Okay? He was trying to build what we call a heat engine. Right? And a heat engine uses the second law of thermodynamics to do mechanical work. All right? So the second law of thermodynamics says that in this high temperature area, I have lots of energy. And over here, where it's cooler, I have less. And so heat naturally wants to flow this way. If I can put the machine I want to do work in between the hot area and the cold area, as the heat flows through there, it can do work because energy is being transferred. So I can capture some of that energy between the hot and the cold. Everyone follow me there? Okay. So that was his idea. If I put my heat engine right here in the middle of the flow, I can catch some of that energy and make it do work. Right? Theoretically, that idea is wonderful. Okay? In practicality, it only works if there's a huge difference between the hot area and the cold area. Okay? It can't be like two degrees difference. Okay? Two degrees difference does not represent a big enough transfer and flow of heat from one place to another to get anything done. Okay? We are talking the difference has to be hundreds of degrees Celsius all right, to get anything practically done. All right, so when a heat engine works, okay, okay, it flows from a high temperature area to a low temperature area, and then we convert the heat into mechanical energy, which can be used to do work. All right, so it converts heat into mechanical energy. All right, but obviously not all of the heat can do useful work. A lot of it is just lost as exhaust. Okay. A jet engine is an example of a heat engine. We talked about that yesterday. Okay. The majority of the heat produced by burning the JP5 jet fuel okay, that a jet burns is essentially kerosene. If you have like a camp stove, it's essentially the same stuff you burn in a camp stove. Okay. Um, most of that is just exhaust. It just goes out the back as heat. All right. I'm not saying it doesn't make those turbines spin and spin really fast. Okay. It does, but again, a lot of that heat is simply lost. Right? If you've ever seen, uh, like gone to an air show, how many people have gone to an air show and watched like the fighter jets and stuff, right? Okay? Uh, it's really cool. You should do it at some point. Um, they have uh, special parts of their engines called afterburners. 
Okay, and what they do is they, when they light the afterburner, they get extra thrust. Okay, because the afterburner recombusts extra fuel. Okay, and produces an even hotter area in the engine. Okay, that allows a greater flow of heat through the engine, giving extra push. All right, and so if you ever see, you know, a, a plane coming in, they usually come in kind of level, and then they just light the burners and they go straight up in the air. Okay, really, really quickly. All right, that's how they get the extra thrust in order to do that. You'd never see a passenger aircraft pull a maneuver like that. All right, because they don't have the power and they're way bigger. All right. Um, all right. So, in, uh, for the example they have here, in an internal combustion engine, okay, the fuel combustion chamber burns at high temperature, okay, and that causes the piston to move and gain mechanical energy, because when you burn fuel, the gases get hotter, and when things get hotter, they, they expand, and that's the pressure that drives the piston downwards. All right. So again, we're using a hot area trying to get out. The heat is trying to get out and go somewhere else. Okay. We're using that to push the piston down. Okay. And then we let that exhaust get out. Okay. During different phases of the uh, the engine, which I'll show you here later. Okay. There's different the valves open and close and allow gases in and out. All right. Uh, so. The uh, hypothetical temperature difference boat, okay, that's shown kind of up there and in this picture in, down here below in your notes, okay, one pipe is in the surface of the ocean, and obviously on the surface the end, the uh, the water is warmer, okay, and one pipe goes really really far down into the deep water where it's cold, and the idea here is that heat will flow through the engine and then down into the cold water. What's the problem with this design? Picture yourself in a crowd. Okay, you're in a really big crowd of people. All right, you need to get. Okay, so here's the crowd. You're stuck in the crowd. You have two options for how to get to this place over here that you want to get to. You could simply walk across the grass and get to here, or you could follow the crowd through a narrow tunnel and then push your way through this hallway and get here. Which way are you going to go? Across the grass, because it's easier. Why is the water going to go through the engine and then down to here, when it's already in contact with the cold water? The answer is it's not. It just doesn't happen. Okay? There's simply not going to be enough flow through this motor to propel a boat. Okay? You'd be lucky if any water went through the engine at all. Right? It'd probably just sit there. Okay? It's unrealistic. It's just simply, it's theoretical, it's nice in theory, it just doesn't work in practice. Right? There's not enough of a temperature difference here for this to work. All right. Um, so according to the second law of thermodynamics, heat never naturally flows from cold to hot. However, heat can be made to move from cold to hot. Okay? So you're not really breaking the laws of physics if you make heat go from a hot area or sorry from a cold area to a hot area because we know that cells can do that with material using active transport right they can transport stuff against or up the gradient they just have to use what active transport uses energy right okay you can make water go uphill it just won't do it on its own okay you have to use energy to do it well it, the same is true with heat I can make a cold area colder by pumping the heat out. What do we? What's in a device that we use that does that all the time? The fridge. Okay, your refrigerator keeps food inside it cold by pumping the heat that gets in there back out into the room. Well, that's going against the natural flow of heat, Shay. The natural flow of heat is that it should be going into the fridge. But we're making sure it goes the other way. When your fridge is running, ever notice this? Hot air comes out from underneath. Okay, It's a heat pump. That heat that you feel is from the food that's inside your fridge. It's actively pumping it out. Now, that said, that works, but your fridge is probably the largest consumer of electricity in your house. Because making stuff go against nature takes a lot of energy. Right. If you, how many people have air conditioning in their house? 
Okay, yeah, a few. All right, an air conditioner is exactly the same as a fridge. Okay, it's doing exactly the same thing. It's trying to keep the temperature in your house lower than it is outside by pumping heat from inside outside, making it go from cold to hot. Okay, you can do it, but you have to put energy in to do it. It's pumping stuff uphill. Everybody with me there? So a heat engine uses the natural flow of heat from hot to cold. If you want to make it go the other way, you need to use a heat pump. Okay? An air conditioner or a refrigerator, those are heat pumps. Okay? They go the other way. All right. Um, so heat engine and heat pumps are similar in that they both operate on the principle that heat naturally flows from a hot substance to a cold substance. Okay? Um, they just kind of do it differently. So um, here's kind of a thermoelectric converter. Remember we talked about how Seebeck made that thermoelectric converter? This is kind of a similar thing. Okay? If I take these two beakers, one of them's got 90 degrees Celsius water and the other has 10 degrees Celsius water, okay? and I put one electrical lead in the hot water, one electrical lead in the cold water, okay? and run them through the electric motor, okay? the heat energy flowing through there would be enough to drive the motor. Okay? And at first, will the motor run really fast? Actually, it'll run fastest at first, but what will happen to the speed of the motor over time? It's going to slow down. Okay? It's going to slow down until the temperatures of these two things are the same. Yeah. Once they're balanced, then there's no flow of heat anymore, and the flow of energy from A to B stops. The motor doesn't drive anymore. All right. Everybody follow me on that? Now, I'm not saying you can go home, grab an electric motor, and put the two wires in hot water and cold water and have it spin. It's not going to work. There has to be a thermocouple in there to make that work. Okay? But it can work if you have a thermocouple in there. Okay? All right. So a thermoelectric converter, okay, which is what we have here, that's Seebeck's invention, okay, is an example of a heat engine. Okay? And it follows the second law of thermodynamics. As long as there's a temperature difference between the hot and cold, okay, energy will flow. But as they begin to close, get closer together, that will stop. All right, heat pump. All right, so a heat pump is your fridge. Okay, and what your fridge is doing, if you've ever seen what the back of your fridge looks like, on the back of your fridge is kind of a grid, okay, or a grill kind of looking thing. Okay, and those are little tiny pipes that contain the refrigerant, okay, which is a special chemical that we use to capture heat. Okay, and what it does is its physical properties are that its boiling point is very close to the temperature you want your fridge to be. So as energy comes off of the food that's in your fridge, it turns this refrigerant from a liquid to a gas. And in doing that, this liquid absorbs large amounts of energy. Okay? So it gains the energy from the stuff in the fridge. Then it gets pumped into this thing called a compressor. Right? And the compressor puts it under pressure. When you put something under pressure, you can turn it back into a liquid. But what will get released when you do that? Uh, not gas, you're turning the gas back into a liquid. It, it took energy to turn it from a liquid to a gas. Now I'm pushing it the other way. What does it have to give off? It has to give off the energy. Okay? That's the heat you feel coming from underneath the fridge. Okay? It's the heat released when the compressor forces that stuff back into a liquid state. The energy comes off. Okay? That's how your fridge steals the energy from your food and pumps it out into your house. Okay? So that means, though, that you can't do what Homer Simpson tried to do Okay, and make your fridge an air conditioner. Okay, he said, I opened the fridge and I discovered it was cold inside. Because, you know, Homer's stupid. Okay, and so what he did is he opened the door, put a big blanket over it, and then sat with the door open under the blanket. Well, where is the fridge trying to pump the hot air? Out into the room. You put a blanket over that, are you preventing the flow of that heat out into the room? So all the fridge is doing is running constantly and never gaining any ground, and eventually he did what to his fridge? Burned it out. Yeah. Okay. Because it was trying to pump the heat it was taking away, which was his heat, okay? and it was trying to get rid of it into the room, but he had prevented the flow of that energy to elsewhere. So the heat pump couldn't pump. Okay? It would pump, but it just kept pumping back onto itself. 
right? It would be like if you were trying to pump out a bathtub and you had the other end of the pump in the bathtub. So it kept pumping the water out and back through the pump and into the bathtub. Do you ever get ahead? You don't, okay? It just keeps pumping it back where you were trying to pump it from, okay? So you can't use your fridge as an air conditioner, right? It won't work. It's trying to pump the heat into your house, okay, to keep it out of the fridge. So don't leave the door open on your fridge. It'll wreck your fridge, okay? All right. Okay, so um, like you said here, for a heat pump, okay, uh, uses electric energy to pump this stuff around, okay, and essentially goes against the second law. All right, on Monday, we're going to start the real math physics part of this, okay? All right, so a heat pump can be like active transport. We can make something go against its natural tendency, but it'll cost us. All right? If heat naturally wants to go from hot to cold, that's fine. But if we want to make it go the other way, we've got to use energy to do that. And that's what a heat pump is doing. And that's why we call it a heat pump. It's just like pumping water uphill. Water won't go uphill on its own. It has to be actively pumped that way. All right? So your refrigerator works like this. Okay? If you've ever, you know, when your refrigerator is running, you can feel the warm air coming out from underneath. Ever notice that? Okay, that is the heat that was taken from the food inside your fridge. Your fridge is pumping it out of the fridge and into your room, into your kitchen. Okay, that's, but I mean, obviously the kitchen is warmer than the inside of the fridge. We're taking heat out of a cold area and pushing it into the warmer area. Here's how your fridge does that and how an air conditioner does it. Okay, there's a, a refrigerant, a fluid, okay, that flows through the walls well, it's in little tiny pipes, but little wires okay, inside the fridge. All right. Um, as energy from your food is absorbed by that because it's colder than your food, it gains energy and it changes state from liquid to gas. Okay. We use a refrigerant that does that at around the temperature we want our fridge and freezer to be. Okay. And it changes state from liquid to gas. As it does that, it absorbs a lot of energy. That then gets pumped now as a gas pumped down to the part of your fridge you can actually hear running. So when your fridge is running, you hear that sound. That sound is the compressor. So the gas gets into that compressor, and the compressor compresses it, puts it under pressure. When you do that to a gas, when you put a gas under pressure, it'll turn back into a liquid. But what does it have to give off? To go from a liquid to a gas, it absorbed energy. I'm now forcing it back into a liquid. In order for it to do that, it has to give off the energy it absorbed. That's the law of conservation of energy. Okay? So as it gives off that energy, your little fan that runs down here under the bottom of the fridge blows that hot air out into the room, pumps the heat from inside the fridge to outside the fridge. But that takes a lot of energy. All right? Your refrigerator is probably your most electricity-hungry appliance. I mean, when you turn your oven on, it'll draw more than your fridge, but your oven's not on all the time. Okay? Your fridge is on all the time. All right? So it uses probably more electricity than anything else in your house. Because right? it's trying to go against the laws of thermodynamics and pump against the, the natural flow. All right? um, so uh, the process is not natural, so work has to be done by the refrigerator. Okay? So to accomplish this, it uses electric energy to pump refrigerant through piping, okay, and then it changes state, okay, like we said. All right, everybody with me on that one? Okay, now, you got a few questions down here, okay, um, that I would say it would be a good idea for you to go over at some point, all right, I'm not actively going to take them in or anything like that, but I would have a look over them, because they're, to some degree, the kinds of things I might ask later. Okay. Everyone with me there? All right. On Monday, we're going to start the like real physics math portion. Okay. Um, but it's easy. Don't get you don't need to be afraid of it. But you do need to have your calculator for Monday. Okay? Cuz you're going to have to do some calculating. So make sure you get one over the weekend, okay, to do that with. Mhm. Mm Far enough?